Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Policy Forum on untapping the potential of non-wood forest products for Europe's green economy. My name is Steven Liebler, and I will be your facilitator for this event. This is the first session of a two-day online event. And as this is the opening session, I would like to introduce two organizations that have had a special role in organizing this policy forum on non-wood forest products. On the first hand, there is the European Forest Institute, EFI. And on the other hand, we have the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO of the United Nations. We are pleased to have two leaders from these organizations with us. And basically, they suggested to have a conversation in this opening part of the uh, event, rather than delivering a formal speech. So let me therefore introduce you first, Mr. Mark Palahi, the director of the European Forest Institute. Welcome, Mr. Palahi. Now, the fact that you are hosting and co-organizing this forum, and I must admit, there is a large stream from your organization dedicating time and efforts, lots of efforts, we can say, uh, to this event. So, and even the fact that you wanted to have this conversation at the start of the policy forum, so that should be considered a very clear indication that somehow this event matters to you. So, could you explain to us why does it matter to you and, and how does this fit in EFI's strategy and objectives. Mr. Palahi. Thank you, Stevens. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, this event matters a lot for EFI, not only the event, but incredible as a project. Because remember that the EFI's mission is to connect knowledge, especially scientific one, to action, to political and business action, especially to unlock the potential of our forest, forestry and forest-based solutions to put the basis for a new post-fossil economy. And this is urgently needed because remember that in the next years, we need to put forward an unprecedented, an unprecedented economic transformation. As in three decades, we need to move towards a climate neutral, nature positive and inclusive economy that prospers within the renewable boundaries of our planet. That is, of course, an unprecedented global challenge due to the speed and the scale of the change needed. And to address that challenge, we will need to mobilize the right scale of, of investments and to develop the right sustainable business models. And science and innovation will play a key role in guiding those investments and guiding those new business models. But making this transformation possible is not only an unprecedented challenge, it is also a great opportunity, especially to rethink our economy in a way that we value our most important capital and also the basis for human health and well-being, which is nature. So the transformation that we have ahead of us is an opportunity to put forward a new economy that prospers in harmony with nature, but powered by nature. It is an opportunity to build an economy where life, remember that bio means life, becomes its true engine and its true purpose. This is why some of us call this paradigm shift a shift towards a circular bioeconomy, because a circular bioeconomy basically is about investing in nature as the true engine of our economy. Is it about managing sustainably our biological systems to produce in a synergistic way food, energy, bio-based solutions to decarbonize our economy, restore biodiversity while creating new jobs. And as you can imagine, the role of forest in making this transformational change possible is crucial because at the end of the day, forests are our most important terrestrial natural capital. But to unlock the, the forest potential, we need to stop looking at our forests with the old paradigm lenses, with fossil economy lenses as a compensation for a broken economic system. We need to start using circular bioeconomy lenses, and then we will see that forests are not only our most important uh, carbon sink or the main host for biodiversity, they are also an amazing source 
for healthy food, biomedicines, and biological resources such as wood, cork, resins that with emerging technologies can be transformed, as we will see during the day, into a totally new range of bio-based solutions that will play a crucial role to decarbonize our economy. So forests are crucial for the economic transformation that we need to put forward. And within that, non-wood forest products need to play a crucial role. Also because of their societal relevance in connecting the rural and the urban walls. I think non-wood forest products can play an important role in contributing to overcome the profound disconnection that there is between our urbanized societies and the natural world. So I think this is enough for the moment, Stephen. Excellent. Well, it's, it's very clear that if, if forests have this crucial role to, to play in this paradigm shift that you just described, then of course the European Forest Institute is, has been pushing uh, as a main actor also in, in making this transition possible. Excellent. Thank you so much for this introduction. Um, now let me introduce the other uh, party. So we have Mr. Ewald Rammelstein with us, and he is the Deputy Director of the Forestry Division of the Food and Agriculture Organization. Welcome, Mr. Rammelstein. I think it is fair to say that we are extremely pleased to have an organization such as the Food and Agriculture Organization as a key supporting organization. And I can really say that it has been much more than lip service. There are several people from your team that have dedicated time, uh, not only the last week, but during several months in making this event a possibility. So thank you for that. But it also means that basically the FAO has been a de facto co-organizer of this policy forum. So which again can be interpreted as an indication that a matter of this non-wood forest products has a clear international dimension. So can you explain to us why did the FAO decide to put its weight behind this event and how does it fit in FAO's strategy and objectives? Please, Mr. Rammelsteiner. Thank you very much, very much indeed and good morning everybody. That is really an excellent event to discuss many of the things that Mark now you, you pointed out. There is not much to add on this front. I very much agree on what you said, Mark. Um, and we see it very much in the same ways. Yet there are, this is a, a perspective where I, I'm, I, I sometimes wonder how far we reach beyond the, the, the non wood forestry community, the non wood forest products community. And how can we make this happen? How, how, do, we, how do we mobilize this view uh, in, a, in, a, in a broader landscape with other policymakers that make the decisions on where to invest in terms of green recovery, in terms of green growth, etc. And that, in a way, also brings us to that event. We, similar to you, we, we think that there is great potential and there are many questions where we need to think together on how to, how to mobilize this, how to focus our energies in areas where we have a breakthrough. Because we, we, if we continue business as usual, uh, we will struggle with the business as usual that we know. Now we have, a, now we scale up the ambition and we can scale up the ambition. There's a role, but how do we make this happen? That I think is, a, is one of the key questions that brings us to that, to that forum uh, and that, to that great group of minds and people that, that think along the same ways of the, of, of the importance and need. For FAO, clearly, um, we overall pursue three goals as an organization. The first one is the eradication of hunger, food in insecurity, and malnutrition, so that people have a sufficient and nutritious food for, uh, for an active and healthy life. And you can see the non wood forest products connection, I believe, immediately. We have around a billion people on the, on the planet uh, that depend to some extent on forest foods uh, for their for for their nutrition, but then there is also the, the the quality of food. It's not only the quantity; it's also the quality of food, uh, the dietary diversity, the issue of 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 the the right nutrients uh, for people, in addition to just the protein or or whatever. And even in in, in Europe, you have you have about a quarter of people. A quarter of households collecting non-wood forest products, for instance, that's not necessarily because they are hungry, but uh, they they appreciate the food, and uh, food is a uh, connector to life. So this is one of the areas that I believe non-wood forest products, if they see the food, if you see the food uh, 
dimension of it, there is a there is a big link to what Fao does. The other, the, the second goal that Fao pursues is uh, elimination of poverty and the creation of sustainable livelihoods. And again, here it's it's very very easy to see the connection of non wood for to non wood forest products. There is around a, a forty percent of the extreme poor that live in forests or in, in woodland grasslands where non-wood forest products not only grow uh, if, it's, uh, if it's plants or live if it's animals, uh, but these are often also easier to convert into income or subsistence use than, than, than wood. So if we tackle poverty, uh, especially the, the extreme poor, uh, then, uh, then non-wood forest products is a very good conduit to do that. The question is how to, how to, how to make this uh, work uh, in a in a more powerful way, because um, much of this happens, if not almost all, uh, in 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 an informal way. We have we have around 1.2 billion people that depend on agroforestry systems, for instance, an an aspect that comes much into play with now with, with the climate change, and also with uh, with biodiversity being big issues on the agenda. How can non wood forest products be positioned as a um, as a solution to enhancing biodiversity, enhancing uh, livelihoods of people, and then enhancing uh, sort of the carbon management that we need for climate uh, mitigating climate change. Great potential. Have we thought it through? Have we positioned it in the right way? We have around 570 million family farms on the planet. Many of those uh, get some incomes from non wood forest products, um, and hence they increase their, their resilience. They re, the resilience of their incomes and may, maybe often also the resilience of the ecosystems. All of this we will need in a in a green growth uh, circular economy type of thinking. So there are many solutions that are somewhere there uh, that are important to to manage, and maybe the time is right to to discuss of how we focus on on these. Uh, let me bring out um, the last point uh, that has been added now. Uh, as we are meeting in a virtual environment, that is because of a health crisis. And also here, normal forest products are, are a, a key player uh, in two ways, at least two ways. One is the safety net. Uh, and many of the people that uh, have suffered uh, from, from the crisis in terms of uh, loss of income and employment, they are migrating back to rural areas or they are uh, happy to have some uh, additional income or sources of, of food uh, from, uh, from non-wood forest products. It just makes families uh, more resilient to the stress, but also the, 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 the role of non-wood forest products in terms of, um, of uh, medicinal plants, uh, this is, plays a, a huge, huge role in, in, in both in, in, in European, but also in, at uh, global levels, around 80% of the population de in developing countries, for instance, relies on traditional medicines. They are, they are often very important, but this is all uh, not necessarily visible, hence doesn't make um, much of an impact in terms of, uh, of uh, people in the, in the ministries of finance, in the ministries of planning, uh, making decisions on where to allocate. And, and if we want to make a dent there, we, we need this type of events, we need this type uh, of, of, um, of uh, projects also to see how we can link the private sector thinking and the governmental thinking of, uh, of really living up to the, to the potential that Mark, you, you have sketched out so, uh, so eloquently and, and to the point. So yes, we are here for this, uh, thinking with you and uh, hopefully benefiting from, uh, from, from the outcome of that great discussion and the project to, to what we do at global levels. It's a, it's a key conduit uh, for the future. Thank you so much, Mr. Ravet Steiner. Both of you are insisting on the importance of this paradigm shift that needs to happen. In Europe, obviously, we have the Green Deal. Uh, that should be an instrument, a major framework guiding this old continent, basically, towards this uh, green economy. But I understand that you, Mr. Ravet Steiner, you are referring to objectives of, uh, of an international level. Huh? So it's probably related to the sustainability development goals. Uh, so objectives uh, that are not uh, only relevant to, to Europe, but that are uh, at, a global, at a global scale. Thank you so much for indicating this, uh, to bringing this to our attention. Um, in fact, I would now like to introduce 
a third speaker we have in this opening session. And we are extremely pleased that we have the Minister of uh, Portugal, the Minister of the Environment and Climate Action of Portugal, uh, who will be with us. Now, his name is João Pedro Matos Fernandes. And we all know that Portugal has a very important uh, role to play in all wood forest products, uh, such as cork, dramaliolus, obviously. But apart from these, uh, it's also relevant to hear his opinion, especially now as Portugal is the president uh, or has the presidency of the European Council. So let us see what he has to say. Unfortunately, he could not be with us during this event, but we have a video that he uh, sent in, and we are quite curious to find out what he will bring as a message. Gerard, can I ask you to perhaps initiate the video? Let me start by congratulating the organizers of this event for providing the opportunity to debate the actions needed to position non-wood forest products as a mainstay of Europeans, Europeans' bioeconomy. It's a great opportunity to reflect on the importance of non-wood forest products to fulfill Europe's policy priorities in relevant areas such as forestry, biodiversity, climate, agriculture and health, focusing on joint action by governments and the private sector to achieve a fair, green and inclusive economy recovery from COVID-19. Over time, non-wood forest products provided by forest territories such as cork, nuts, wild berries, aromatic and medicinal plants, wild mushrooms, resin, game and fishing uh, or grassland have become fundamental in maintaining the vitality and sustainability of these territories. Forest and its non-wood products are vital to the culture and economy of human populations as they provide raw materials, food, health or employment, having also a major influence on social and cultural identity and heritage, among others. The relevance of non-wood forest products in the ecological, social and economic dimensions has not yet been fully assumed and incorporated either in the man management and valorization of forest areas or in forest policies. In general, the importance of these products is underrated. Non-wood forest products represent a significant component of the economic value of forests in Europe. A recently published study on a quantitative overview of the value of non-wood forest products in Europe estimated that these products represent 71% of the value of roundwood removals. For a long time, the potential of these products was often ignored by policymakers, but it is now clear how central and decisive is the role of forests and its products in climate change mitigation. Non-wood forest products have become key in maintaining the vitality and sustainability of forests. By promoting the circular economy, these products can help us on the path towards a more sustainable future and a stepping stone in the implementation of measures contributing to the increasingly robust and successful European Green Deal. There is, indeed, an enormous potential for the non-food forest products in Europe's green economy. Europe needs a closer look to its endogenous natural resources and non-wood forest products are an important component in the European bioeconomy bio strategy. This message should be stressed in the upcoming EU forest strategy that includes as its main objectives effective forestation, preservation and recovery of the European forests, increasing CO2 sequestration, reducing the impact of pests, reducing the frequency and extent of forest fires and promoting bioeconomy while fully respecting ecological principles favorable to biodiversity. There are no doubts regarding the value of nature-based solutions to achieve the goals set by the European Union 
towards the global challenges to reverse biodiversity loss, climate change and stop land degradation. The perspective of adopting nature-based solutions focused on the relevance of forests multiple use can be a sensible approach to address all the above objectives. Forest is the main Portuguese land use, representing more than a third of the entire territory. The National Forest Strategy confirmed the economic relevance of non-wood forest products, which represent 45% of the total economic value of the forest sector. Likewise, the Statistic National Institute figures shows the non-wood products contribution in reducing the Portuguese trade deficit. In 2019, this product has a positive trade balance of 857 million euros and coverage rates significantly higher than one. Cork has a major contribution in these figures. Since Portugal is the world's largest producer, processor and exporter of cork-related products, which goes far beyond the production of cork stoppers. For example, Portuguese cork oak forests are an important barrier to desertification, one of the European biodiversity hotspots and the CO2 retention capacity of these forests can reach more than 14 tons per hectare and per year. Furthermore, the transformation process of cork contributes significantly to the national economy and has a strong local component. Cork products also play a relevant role in the bioeconomy as highlighted in the EU Green Deal, namely for sustainable and eco-efficient building and house constructions. Nuts and wild berries also represent a relevant source of income from non-wood forest products. An example of this product's relevance in the provision of ecosystem services is the importance of the umbrella pine and the poor sandy soils of Portugal's southern, southern areas. Besides the relevant ecological role, umbrella pine's nuts represent a very important income for forest owners. I would also like to highlight the potential of maritime pine resin. Portugal is supporting the recovery of the resin extraction sector to supply higher amounts of raw material to the industry. It is a good example of a sector that generates regular income for forest owners, creates employment in rural areas, makes a positive contribution to the economy and plays an important role in the active management and protection of maritime pine forests. The Portuguese Recovery and Resilience Plan, whose public consultation ended a few days ago, is a broad strategic document that includes key structural reforms to ensure the exit from the pandemic crisis with the perspective of a resilient future. In its several dimensions, includes investment and innovation in strategic areas for the future of the forestry sector, namely in landscape transformation, valorization of the territory natural capital and the focus on the multifunctionality of agroforestry territories as a way to contribute to territorial cohesion. This plan foreseen an amount of 150 million euros in order to shift the paradigm towards a sustainable bioeconomy that will support the transition of the textile, footwear and resin sectors. Currently, the textile and footwear sectors have a great potential in the integration and valorization of forest and agricultural biomass as well as secondary raw materials, particularly from the agro-food industry. The entire value chain of these sectors needs to be involved, starting with the use of sustainable raw materials from a bio base to a global market, focusing on tools that ensure transparency and traceability of the value chain, life cycle analysis, including consumer qualification and awareness, 
such as advanced stakeholder training and dedicated marketing for sustainable and responsible consumption. To conclude, the vision and strategy for the forest sector requires actions to promote the emerging, the emerging bio-based green economy, underpinned by increasing circularity of materials, the promotion of a sustainable bioeconomy. In this context, the multiple services provided by forests, including non-wood products, are highlighted as a strategic focus on policy measures. I wish you all a successful and faithful event. Thank you. I would like to thank Minister Matos for this very interesting presentation or uh, speech, basically, in which he clearly highlighted the importance, the relevance of the sector for Portugal, obviously, but well beyond Portugal, and already indicating several of the challenges that we will be discussing throughout the two days of this event. So thank you so much, Mr. Matos, uh, for this uh, very important contribution, which is very much appreciated. Now, let us return to the two persons that we have uh, with us, so the two guests for this uh, opening section, um, and perhaps to make a transition towards the real operational start, so to speak, of this policy event, I have a question for you. Now, this is a two-day event, right? So we have four sessions, and tomorrow evening, Wednesday evening, all of us will have been part of an event with many presentations, there will be videos, there will be exchange, there will be discussions, questions and answers, etc. So there are many ingredients, but after everything has been said and done, so at the evening of Wednesday, huh? and when both of you will be looking back at this event, when will you have the feeling this has been a success? So what are your key expectations and how would you like to trigger the participants to this event to really contribute to achieving this success? Please, perhaps uh, Mr. Palahi first? Thank you, Steven. Let, let me first tell you that I, I was very happy to hear Minister Matos' intervention, you know, really a strong vision, and I, I wish there would be more European uh, policymakers with such a clear and, and holistic vision on, on forest. And, and regarding expectations for the event, maybe I, I want to link that with something that was mentioned by Minister Matos, and is the fact that Europe has now a, a EU Green Deal, as you know, but uh, EU Green Deal will not succeed, succeed unless it engages with those managing our most important green infrastructure in Europe, which is our forest. And there is a real gap in, in that sense. So in my opinion, there will not be a EU Green Deal without a new deal for European forest. And, and in that sense, I wish that the, this incredible event becomes a call for action towards that direction. I think we need to make the, the forest voice much stronger in the, in the context of the green transition that we are starting in Europe, because there are very big gaps in terms of how uh, the Green Deal is perceiving the potential of forest. I mentioned at the beginning that we need to stop looking at our forests with fossil economy lenses. In my view, the EU Green Deal still look at our forests with fossil economy lenses as a compensation for a broken system. And in that sense, we need to also show the social and economic relevance of forests where non-wood forest products, as I mentioned before, play a fundamental role. So I hope that this event becomes a call for action eh, towards a new deal for European forest in the context of the EU Green Deal. Thank you so much. So over to Mr. Ramachtaya. So what are your expectations for this event? Just as Mark, let me also uh, congratulate Minister Matos on this very clear uh, presentation and vision on the on the way forward, how to place uh, the non-wood forest products into into a reality setting of today's ambitions that we have with uh, with a circular economy in the Green Deal. Uh, likewise. With regard to the global levels, we we support countries on the SDGs, and also here uh, we look and work very closely with uh, the EU on the Green Deal and its global links. So we we do hope that from uh, from this 
event and its outcome. We can take inspiration in the context of the EU and the global connections of the Green Deal, but also in the context of our work in, the, in, the, in, in regard to the European Forestry Commission. Uh, the next session will be held in Turkey, uh, and Turkey is one of uh, the leaders in, in many respects uh, on, on normal forest products, uh, just to mention honey or, or nuts or many other, many other products that uh, Turkey has, uh, has quite a, a leading edge. Uh, and also we have the Silver Mediterranean Network with, in which we hope to, to be able to carry uh, work of this forward. But um, beyond the region, we also would really hope to get inspiration and also some push for action from that group and from that event in the context of helping the, the countries fulfill the SDGs. The SDGs have a few priorities. One of them is leaving no one behind. And, uh, and normal forest products are really well placed to, to, to contribute to this. They are reaching uh, everybody, uh, also in remote rural areas, which many sometimes are left behind. They are, the, the SDGs are also a, a driver of, uh, of saying that the private sector needs to be involved strongly. And that is also something that uh, this project and, and the Normal Forest Project has brought up uh, strongly. But what private uh, sector needs is, um, on the one hand, data, on the other hand, attractiveness for investment, uh, both public and private, small and big. So how, how can uh, Normal Forest Products uh, be made an attractive investment? And if we want to get uh, towards the, the transformation ambition, the, the upscaling ambition, we need business models, so to say, that are that are replicable, where the risk is contained, and that are that can be mainstream. Just as uh, the example from uh, from Mr. Matos on uh, on this long uh, uh, work and experience on on cork, that is a business model that has worked for many, many, many years. Uh, we need such type of business models for, for, for products where people are willing to invest because it makes sense for them. And only then we will see the transformation that, uh, that, we, that we talk about. Uh, and that will need innovations. It will need innovations in the way we think and how we approach, but also in the way we use data and IT to accelerate this change. And the, the EU uh, knowledge community and the EU uh, business community and the EU as a, as a, as a community of, of policymakers uh, driving action, uh, all of this, of course, what you're doing here is, is, a, is in a way a thought leadership and an action leadership role that we would be happy to continue working with you closely on, on seeing how we can make this happen uh, from, from the FAO side. With this, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to the discussion and to, to good outcomes from, uh, from that event. And thank you once again for, for the opportunity to contribute. Let me also uh, thank the colleagues uh, here at VAO that, that have made this happen with you. I'm happy that this this is possible. Thank you Back so to much. You. Thank you so much for your uh, expect for stating your expectations. It's very clear that uh, this is quite ambitious, I would say. Uh, so you have high expectations with respect to supporting, if not to say, accelerating this transformation towards the green economy. So a call for action, not only for policymakers, but we understand also towards the private sector, towards uh, promoting reflections on the business models, etc. So, well, we have your expectations, and I think this is a perfect time probably to initiate or to, to start with uh, the, the, the program of our two-day event. I would like to thank both of you gentlemen for your availability to also having to have suggested to make this a conversation rather than a formal speech. I think it's, it's perfect uh, and, and wonderful way for you to state the message as you wanted to state. Thank you so much. And uh, we're going to proceed now with uh, the introductions to the um, policy forum. Thank you so much. So, and to introduce, uh, to bring the further introductions to the policy forum, I will now return to this uh, presentation slide, and I hope, let's see, Sarah, could you confirm that what you're looking at is the full screen, is that okay? Could you briefly confirm? Yes, I'm seeing the presenter view. So it's okay. 
Yeah. No, no, I'm seeing the presenter view. I'm not seeing the full screen. Okay, so that's uh, okay. So I will shift now to this one. It should be hopefully okay now. Yes, Can now it's it? fine. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. We might be doing some sorts of checks like this uh, throughout the day. So here we are with uh, some introductory slides. Um, yes, yeah, so we have this. So let's restate why are we here today and why are we organizing this event? Well, in very generic terms, you might say that we want to explore the potential of non-wood forest products. I think the speakers we had in this introductory part already quite clearly hinted at this potential. And this forum basically offers a forum, a platform, if you like, to explore this potential and to discuss this. Uh, it's more than that. We would also like to discuss actions needed to position non-wood forest products as a pillar of Europe's bioeconomy. And when preparing for this policy forum, in fact, there has been a white paper prepared, a white paper on policy priorities for non-wood forest products in Europe. And we will use this forum to basically explore, engage with you on several sections of this white paper, which then allows you, participants, to become familiar with this uh, document. Now, how do these objectives translate in terms of an agenda? You have seen the agenda in the program, so this uh, slide should look familiar to you. It's a two-day event, so we have today, we have tomorrow. Each time there's a session uh, in the morning, a session in the afternoon. Session one is focusing on setting the scene, disclosing the potential of non-wood forest products. That is the session you are in right now. This afternoon, we will have a second session focusing on sustainable sourcing and secure supply of non-wood forest products. Tomorrow morning, we will be focusing on competitive and equitable non-wood forest products value chains. And the concluding session, session four, which will be tomorrow afternoon, is going to be really about this call for action. So that really comes very much in, in let's say, or close to the uh, expectations that have been stated by um, our two uh, contributors to the opening uh, part. Now, let's focus on what's on the plate for today, for this morning. You have a detailed agenda in the handouts or the program that you will have found on the internet. So this setting is about setting the scene, disclosing potential of non-wood forest products. And we will have uh, several subsections, if you like. The first one is a call for action to leverage non-wood forest products potential. So it's basically stating why this call for action is so important. Uh, then we will proceed by presenting a document that will pretty much play a rather important role in this two-day event. We will return to this document several times. And at the end of this uh, policy forum, we even would like to have a clear statement and a position from your side, from the participant side, with respect to this manifesto. But obviously then first we have to introduce the document and that will be uh, what is happening uh, in the session today. Now after this, we come to a keynote speech. We will have keynote speeches in all four sessions. The keynote speech for this session is about from local to global, the enduring power and promise of forest goods. After which we will have a session on perspectives from the value chain with several contributions. Some of them are videotaped, others are uh, presentations, but all of them show the richness and the diversity of non-wood forest products. And we'll have some time for debate as well. So let's take a closer look. Who are you? So who did register for this policy forum? Well, we have over 350 registered participants. I think right for this session, we should be around 120, 130. But in total, over 350 participants have registered, which I think it's fair to say is uh, an astounding success. Um, when we were designing this forum, we thought, well, let's hope for 100, 200 participants, but it's much, much more 
Huh? So what's the profile? These participants are coming from 55 countries, but if you look at the division, you see the pie chart, Spain and Portugal are, well, it's almost a pie, I would say, but they together take uh, almost uh, two thirds of the participants. We have uh, 14 participants roughly coming from Italy, uh, a similar uh, figure from uh, Greece, and then we have France, Tunisia, but there are participants from many, many more countries, 55 in total. But as to the profile, it's a 60-50% uh, um, ratio between participants coming from public institutions or the private sector, which is good. We are pleased to have 40% uh, uh, coming from the private sector in a policy event. Uh, so 40% of the participants are from research and academia, so that's a rather large number, which we could uh, uh, expect, obviously. But we are especially pleased to also have 15% technicians and practitioners. We also have, uh, obviously, a smaller figure, but still 5% people that can be situated at top management in either policy or business uh, contexts. And we have participants coming from international organizations. So it's a quite diverse mixture we have. Uh, we, we asked the question whether participants would be interested in a particular island. And like you can see, the majority of people signaled to have an interest in all of these islands. Islands are these innovation networks that have been pretty much at the core of this incredible project. Um, and we had uh, ionets on aromatic and medicinal plants, on wild mushrooms and truffles, on cork, wild nuts and berries, and on resins. And as you can see, some people clearly indicated to have uh, a specific preference, but most people uh, were interested in all of the islands. So that's about you. What about us? Well, here you see all the logos of all the uh, basically organizations that are consortium partners of this incredible H2020 project on innovation networks for core present and edibles in the Mediterranean area. So there are lots of partners that have worked together for several years uh, and many of them have been involved in the preparations for this. So let me briefly state the core team organizing this event. So the organizing team consists of European Forest Institute, the um, uh, FAO, but apart from these two, CESE4, uh, Forestas, INEA, and ESLET have played uh, um, a role as well. And I would like to highlight two uh, persons in particular. First is Sara Maltoni from Forestas in Sardinia and Alvaro Picardo from uh, Castilla y Leon. Uh, both of them have been basically the main driving forces, have been pushing for months. Uh, organizing um, meetings, uh, basically, if there would be two persons that had been in either address of emails or uh, in the copy, the CC of the emails, I think they must have, it would be these two persons and they have received, I think, tons of messages. Uh, so I would like to, I think it's uh, fair to at least highlight uh, these two persons. Now, to handle this particular Zoom session, there is an AFI team consisting of five persons. You see the name here, so the names here. Uh, we also have communication and live tweeting, tweeting which is taken care of by CESE4. We also have two persons that we like as rapporteurs for this session. It's either Rodriguez from CESE4 together with her colleague Ricardo Castellini. As to the facilitation, there is me, Stephen, and we have a backup facilitator. You never know with online events, uh, and that will be Sarah Adams uh, from the European Forest Institute. So let's proceed. What about an online event? Originally, the idea was to have this policy forum in Sardinia. We all know that this was not going to be possible. So at some point, we had to decide and switch towards uh, an online event. Um, one of the things means that obviously we have to reflect on yes, if we still want to have interactivity, how do we make this possible? Huh? We have done our best to design uh, an event that consists of a variety of formats. Uh, we will include some level of interactivity through the Q&A, uh, but also through some polling exercises, etc. So and we hope that we somehow can at least uh, get your attention and uh, keep you involved 
for the four sessions. We really hope we will succeed in that. Uh, I would like to mention or highlight that this Zoom webinar, will, that this Zoom session will be recorded. Uh, you should have received uh, a notification uh, and a consent basically by or when accessing to this uh, Zoom. So, but just to be clear on this, it's a reminder. If you have a problem with that, we hope it's not the case, but if it's really a problem to you, uh, we feel it's our responsibility to make sure that you know this is the case and that you can take, if needed, uh, the, the measures you need to take. Yeah? We are using Zoom webinar, which is slightly different from the regular Zoom in the sense that presenters have different settings, a different role, if you like, compared to regular participants. So regular participants will not be able to activate themselves, themselves, the camera or microphone functionality. So these settings are taken care of by the organizing team at uh, EFI. We have a special uh, approach towards questions and answers. Uh, but before diving into that, let me as a final uh, statement say, let's try to have a respectful debate that obviously is not going to uh, be any problem. I'm quite sure it's my role to help you in that as well. Huh? Uh, but there's going to be a need to respect some time. So if we, if the facilitators, me or somebody else, if we state that we have to move on, it's certainly not an expression of uh, lack of interest in the presentation that is being uh, stated or uh, the arguments being put forward. It's just that we need to respect the time because this program that we would like to complete. Now, let me hand the word to Sarah Adams to perhaps briefly explain how we will do with questions and answers. Sarah. You're muted, Sarah. Sarah, you're muted. My apologies, my apologies. Um, thank you, Stephen, and good morning to you all. And absolutely delighted to be able to see so many of you here um, this morning with us. And as Stephen explained, um, most of the attendees of the meeting um, are not able to share their screens or their voices, um, but they can see and hear everything that's going on. But that doesn't mean to say that we don't want to hear from many of you. So we have a functionality in Zoom webinar called the question and answer um, functionality. And if you have a look at the screen now, um, you should be able to see um, where I've highlighted the question and answer boxes. And if you look at the bottom of your screens, that's where you will find it, just next to the participants icon. If you click on that question and answer icon, you will see that you will be able to type a question um, in the box there. Um, type your question, it might be a general question, it might be directed to a specific speaker. If so, please type the name of the speaker you'd like to address your question to. And also don't forget to um, identify yourself if your Zoom identity doesn't do that for you. Um, you'll be able to see all the questions that have been typed by other attendees and you will be able to give a thumbs up to any questions that you like, which raises the profile of that question. So the more the thumbs up that we have, the question gets raised up and it will go to the top of the list and it's more likely to get answered. So if you see a question that you like, please give it the thumbs up if you're an attendee and it will help us to, to see the questions that, that are most important um, for this session. Your questions may be answered in three different ways. Um, we may, in the FE team, identify some short questions and put them directly to the speakers. It may be that a speaker decides to type an answer to your question and they can do that. They have, they have access to, do, to be able to do that. Or it may be that we will invite some of you to ask your questions live. In that case, we will give you a short warning beforehand to say we will be inviting you to, to, to ask your question live. You have some minutes to prepare. And then we will invite you to turn on your video, to turn on your microphone, and we will have given you rights to be able to do that. You will then, at that moment, be able to ask your question live. You put your question to your speakers, they could answer you, you could reply back to them, 
And when we've closed the question, you'll go back to being an attendee. So it means that some of you will be able to, to, to ask your questions directly to the speakers. In order to be able to do that, please don't forget to identify yourself when you type your question, if it's not obvious from your Zoom link. Um, and the last thing I wanted to point out is that if you are a tweeter and you do like communications at the top right hand corner of, of the banner of the most of the corporate presentations, you will see the hashtag NWFP policy and you can use that if you if you're tweeting and you'd like to draw attention to this event. If there are any questions on that, um, I think it's pretty clear, Stephen, right? So thank you so much for explaining, uh, Sarah. So now all participants have also uh, got a few on you. So and you can, uh, there might be situations and you will have to act as the co-moderator. Uh, so, but I think we have all ingredients to start. So let's just go ahead. And can I invite the first speaker we have? Uh, it is Inazio Martinez de Arano. He is the head of the European Forest Institute, but then more specifically, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean facility, which is based in uh, Barcelona. Uh, what can I tell about Inazio? He has been, well, he obviously, apart from being the director, the director, he's an expert in the field of uh, forestry. But I think much more important to say here is that he has been not only the coordinator, but I would even say the person that initiated this incredible project. So he has been the architect of this project uh, when designing it, when preparing for it. And throughout the last three years, he has been pushing all of us, all of the consortium members, uh, inspiring us, pushing us to be even more ambitious and to make sure that we will do whatever was needed to promote this non-wood forest uh, product sector. So I think there's probably no other person better placed than uh, Inacio to, well, explain a bit on a call for action to leverage potential of non-wood forest products. So please, Inacio, go ahead. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for the introduction. I want to start giving also thank you to our hosts, Ewald and Mark, and to Minister Matos for setting the scene and making this excellent uh, opening of, uh, of this session. Uh, and thank you also to all participants for joining us uh, in, in what is, uh, we believe, a, an important moment. Uh, not only the project, we hope also in the, in outside the project. First of all, also, I would like to start uh, giving you some context in the next five minutes about why we are here, why we organize this policy forum, but especially why we conceive it as a call for action. This journey started uh, some over three years ago, of course, building on existing work, on existing networks and existing knowledge. But we started in this specific pathway three years ago with three, com three elements in mind. First of, first one were the, the main challenges and uncertainties for the future of the Mediterranean region. And, and in the words of the World Economic Forum, this, this can be phrased as the fragility of natural resources in a context of climate change and, and global change, and the way we're going to address the, the, that fragility. Second big challenge is how Mediterranean societies are going to be able to provide quality jobs and employment also in rural areas. The Mediterranean region has a structural employment in both east, west, north and south. So how we're going to address this? And the third challenge and the third uncertainty for our future is how we are going to address these two other challenges together. What type of connections across the region we're going to build and what, what solidarities. So this, 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 so we wanted uh, through this incredible project to, to put our small strengths uh, and, and, so, uh, and to provide some solutions and some visions on, on how to address these challenges. Um, second is, is this, uh, this Mediterranean paradox that comes with forest, the forest Mediterranean paradox. We all recognize the values of forest, a biodiversity hotspot providing uh, numerous ecosystem services and, 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 and for, for the wilderness society. But somehow we are unable to realize those values. And somehow Mediterranean forests are even a headache. They're a sink of public resources. We need to protect them from fire. We need to protect them from people. We need to, uh, so instead of being a source of richness, sometimes they are a source of, of these services and problems. And, and, and we are not able to realize its full, full, full potential. And, and of course, the third element is, is our passion for non-forest products and the understanding of the enormous potential 
that has been highlighted by the previous speakers in terms of, of making these links between society and forestry, improving forest management, and being able to realize, uh, also be able to tackle these, these, these core challenges of the region. So, <clears throat> so with these elements, we, we tap the opportunity of a marvelous instrument of the European Commission, H2020 projects, also in Northern Europe, which is these thematic networks, which are a specific type of project oriented at mobilizing knowledge, both from science and from practice. So we started um, this proposal. We created these five innovation networks on different non forest products. We map together the value chains. We identify opportunities for action, for innovation. Uh, we, we mix in cross-cutting uh, themes like territorial marketing, digitalization of, of non forest product sectors. We, we made transitional, regional, national events, over 70 events all, all along these three years. And, in, and through all this process, we have been compiling, of course, barriers, but more importantly, ways forward, recommendations for actions. So in this three-year work and, and, and linking with FAO, linking with UFRO, linking with other existing networks, we have compiled this and, and, and imagined this, this white book as a, as a call for action. So, so now it's time to share this white book with you. Uh, it's time that you take some ownership from it. We really want to hear from you and that you uh, provide us with your knowledge also and that you make uh, this this white book also also yours in this sense we are very happy to see that how all these ideas are condensing in this manifesto that we'll be presenting below because we, because we believe uh, that we need to advance towards a common vision or at least towards more shared visions in this domain of non-good forest products which are so much in the boundary sometimes of forestry and nature agriculture and forestry, wild and managed, uh, formal and informal. So, so this is it, this is it. We want that, uh, that you take ownership of what book, that you join us in, in, in improving it, and that you take urgent action to address those core literary challenges. Thank you so much, uh, Inacio, for uh, um, setting the frame basically for uh, the two days that we're having here and restating basically the importance of this, uh, this call for action. Now, you mentioned this uh, manifesto, which brings us basically to the next speaker. And I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Sven Walter. He is a senior forestry officer and a team leader uh, on forest products and statistics at the FAO. And I can say that he has been a very active uh, uh, member, if you like, of the organizing committee for the last uh, several months. Uh, he has been involved in, in many of the discussions, um, helping us to sort out things. Uh, so, and one of the documents that is going to play a role in this um, policy forum is this uh, manifesto. Uh, Sven, can I ask you to introduce this uh, document? What is this manifesto about? Yes, thank you very much, and I will do so. Uh, thank you, Stephen, and welcome to, to everybody. Let me just first say that from FAO side, we are happy to accompany the incredible project throughout the years, also as a member of the advisory committee. And it's great that we join forces here together for this uh, final workshop or for the policy forum. When we heard in the opening, um, the expectations, we heard that we want to see a call for action. We would like to take inspiration and innovation. And in order to do so, we need to reach out to decision makers and to investors. Of course, we do so, for example, through our engagement, for example, through the project, through the INET, but we also have certain tools to, to do so. And one tool, Inazio mentioned it already, is the, the white book. And I would just to introduce first quickly one word to the white book and then focus on the manifesto, because the white book is really something which you have seen already as participants, which has been prepared by the team and which will in be enriched through the workshop and which is an important deliverable of the project. And as Inazio said, I hope that we can all also take ownership of it. But we would like to go one step further. We would also like to have a, a call for action from us as the participants of the workshop and basically have a reference document from this workshop. And that is the so-called manifesto. You will get the draft version in a second in your, in your email, and uh, we will have the chance to review it at the end of the, of the meeting. 
So the objective here is really to have one uh, reference document which summarizes the key issues we would like to see addressed. It should not duplicate the white book, but really be a summary of the key issues discussed. And if I may share, Stephen, uh, my screen for a second. Yes, please. I will share with you, and I hope you can see it, yep. the, the draft outline of it, which you will see. And the first thing you will see that it, we propose to be called it Manifesto of Allegro. And Stephen, you mentioned that we were supposed to meet in Sardinia, which would have been very nice. And so we want to give tribute to our host with the name. Also, it's of course great that we can meet now here also um, virtually. The manifesto as such has proposed like, you know, five broad sections. We have an introductory session, section which basically reference um, the manifesto to the event and to the white paper. And then we have some paragraphs which will, or which are proposed actually, to make reference to the multifunctionality of forest. And we heard it very well from Minister Matos this morning, how important that is, so that we get the reference to these, you know, important aspects. We would then propose some text on the relevance of non-wood forest products. And we heard it both from Mark and from, from Ewald, uh, who were talking both about, for example, their contributions to health and well-being, and obviously their contributions to the Sustainable Development Goals. We will hear about it throughout the seminar, obviously, and also to the nature-based solutions and through the different strategies which are being prepared or implemented at the European level. In follow-up, again, uh, highlighting some of the key issues we believe are important you know, to consider and to, to highlight, and then noting the weaknesses and threats related to non-wood forest products and the issue of climate change has already been highlighted earlier today, but we also have others. We said that this should be a call for action and obviously in the following section we are proposing action by different stakeholders and we are looking in particular into key actions. And we have identified four and these four, I think Stephen you will come back to this in a second, are actually, you know, very important for us and it will be interesting throughout the discussions in the different sessions to get your feedback, you know, on, on this. And on this basis, we have again this call for action for the different stakeholders and uh, we will sum up with some, con basically I would call this, you know, con conclusion. So you will get a copy of this draft paper. We will take note during the discussion of key points to enrich it. We invite you also to provide um, comments in, in writing. You will get some email addresses of colleagues in order to provide comments so that then we would be able to share a revised version at the end. And we hope that as participants, again, participants in, in our personal capacities, we may be able to endorse this in order to formulate our, our joint vision. And so that we have maybe at the end a good reference document of this workshop, which would then complement again the white paper, which is the main output and really summarizing it in a more holistic way, way while the manifesto should really highlight some key issues. I think that's all from my side at the moment, Stephen, and again to the participants, you will get an email in the coming minutes with the draft document. Thanks and back Thank you. to you, Stephen. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Sven, for sharing the document, for also even showing the document. So we understand it very clearly. So the participants will all receive an email with this document, this manifesto. You will receive in the same email an indication of how you can send in your uh, input, because what we want you to do is to read this document, to perhaps even critically read this document. And if you have a clear suggestion you would like to make, we're not talking about typos, but uh, things related to the input, the messages. Uh, please send us to them, um, because the idea is that during the fourth uh, session, so tomorrow afternoon, we will come back to this document, and Sven Walter will again present the document with indications on the type of comments we have received so far. Thank you so much. Now, 
as it is the IT, that all participants will have a closer look at us at this document, we thought, why not force them already to take some kind of position with respect to some key paragraph of this document. And for this reason, we would like to do a quick polling exercise. And let me go to this uh, shared screen. Yes, it should be this one. So you should be looking now at my web browser. Sarah, can you quickly confirm that is the case, just to avoid uh, me? Yes, I can see Excellent. that. Excellent. So the question we have to you, participants, is the following. You see here a list of four activity areas, if you like, and these are the four areas that are explicitly mentioned. This is even the phrasing used in this manifesto. So the first is secure the conservation and sustainable supply of non-wood forest products. The second is build competitive and equitable value chains. Then we have number three, improve transparency, date, and information data and information flows on non-wood forest products. And then finally, number four, establish conducive enabling conditions. And by this we mean institutional action, financial support, support innovation, knowledge transfer, things like this, right? So these are the four listed uh, policy action areas. The question we have to you is, we would like you to give a score to each of these four, a score from one to seven. It says five, but it is seven. One meaning, I don't think this area is of particular importance. Seven, on the other hand, means it is highly important. And it's basically, you have sliders that you can play with for each of these four areas. And we would like you to show, to just give your score and use it to also indicate the relative importance of these four, right? So if you want to go to, can I invite all of you to go to WooClub? I will here show you, it's the website, WooClub.com. And then you have to give in this code, S-J-D-F-R-R. -R. And if you do so, you can participate. We're quite interested to see the outcomes. Please, you can go ahead. Let me see the scores coming in. I see there are already 22 persons uh, that, have, that are active at this moment, considering the positioning of these sliders. Stephen, people are asking to add the link in the question and answer if possible. We will take care of that. If, if you can take care of that, because I don't see it on my uh, I would need to switch screens, basically. Let's see if I can do it. Turning the screen to the QR code as well. Could do. So those that still want to join us at WooClub, it's www.wooclub.com. And then you have to give in a code or you can do it immediately after the slash. And the code is SJDFRR. -R as you see on the screen, and we have the QR code as well. We have already 59 persons, 60 persons now participating, which is good. I'll give it just one more minute. So wooclub.com SJDFRR, which is the code. Seventy-five people participating. We keep it going for one more minute. Yeah. 
80 participants. It's still increasing. You have 85 participants participating. Half of them have submitted. It might be that depending on your uh, screen size, that you have to scroll to see the fourth uh, area of activity. And then after putting the sliders the way you want, don't forget to push uh, the submit uh, button. And so far, we see that uh, basically all four are receiving a quite similar level of uh, importance, uh, slightly more towards uh, security, conservation, and sustainable supply of wood forest products. But in the meantime, number four, established conducive enabling actions uh, has incurred. Okay, so we have 90 participants. I will give, this is the final minute for you to cast your vote. Okay, 30 seconds left. So if you want to give your input, this is the moment to do so. 70 persons have given their input out of 90. So 20 other persons, please. Don't forget to push uh, the submit button to cast your vote. Excellent. Okay, well, let's, let's take a closer look at the results we have. This is by no means a scientific study. This is, first of all, a way to get you involved and engaged actively in this uh, policy forum. But also we wanted to gauge uh, how you feel about these four area of policy actions, especially as this will be, some of this will be discussed in a to large extent in the coming uh, sessions we have. And uh, we're glad to see that, uh, well, it's quite clear you, you attach a lot of uh, importance to all four. Huh? And I think this, uh, it's a nice uh, indication of the level of uh, well priority these areas are uh, receiving from your side. Good. Well, this closes this uh, interactive part. I'm going to stop uh, the share screen. Those of you that still want to cast your votes can do so. I will leave it open. But unfortunately, I think we have to move on to the program. It's not really unfortunately because I have the pleasure to know move to our first keynote speaker and we have a keynote speech on from local to global uh, the engineering power and promise of forest goods and to deliver this speech we have Patricia Shanley she's from People and Plants International I will not give any further introduction to her as I know that she will be taking care of that herself but let me say as one, uh, let me make, make one statement. She's dialing in from the United States. So there is a time difference. And we know that, especially for the testing sessions yesterday, she had to wake up at an almost impossible time to still be part of it. And it was a clear indication of her um, enthusiasm and energy that she wanted to spend on this. Um, Mrs. Uh, um, Mrs. Shandy, can I ask you to uh, perhaps take it from here? perhaps introduce yourself or uh, initiate the presentation you have prepared, please. The presentation, the video will be shared by Gerard. Okay, yes. Good morning, I'm Patricia Shanley and I wanna thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. I believe the Incredibles Network is doing vital work, synthesizing key findings about wild resources and turning science into action to address the most urgent issues we face today, biodiversity loss, food security, and climate change. I have lived and worked in forests my whole life, in Brazil, Indonesia, and the US, and I'm certain 
that non-wood forest products have a central role to play in supporting sustainable solutions for these critical problems. Today, we will be speaking about forest goods from local to global. So I would like to begin locally by asking each of you to recall the first wild edible that blooms near your home, where it emerges, and what it tastes like. Today, I will be speaking on behalf of a network of researchers, practitioners, and communities from People and Plants International. We will include video clips in the pre presentation to share the voices of some of the local communities we work with. Non-wood forest products are a remarkable idiosyncratic array of extraordinary species we daily use for food, medicine, shelter, tools, and crafts. These range from roots and shoots to feathers and fur to fibers and fungi. They are found in ecosystems worldwide and have sustained humankind for millennia. For most of human history, they were the sole source of sustenance. In modern times, they become a robust player in global trade. For example, the international trade in medicinal and aromatic plant species has almost tripled in recent years from $1.3 billion in 1998 to $3.3 billion in 2018. On the left in the photo, we see Kurumi looking upward, estimating the assets in his forest portfolio of fruit production of Pikia. For 20 years, he helped research the value of this species and others toward the livelihood of his community. Over the past 40 years, there's been a tendency to analyze forest goods using an economic lens alone, which has overlooked the many other values non-wood forest products hold, cultural, social, ecological, and health, which has led to some misguided assumptions and myths. Here we see a few of the more common. The patterns depicted here demonstrate that when incomes increase or prices for non-wood forest products rise, demand for forest goods fall and that inexpensive substitutes tend to replace forest goods. While these patterns may prevail for some internationally traded non-wood forest products, they generally do not capture trends of subsistence use and local and regional markets that make up the majority of non-wood forest product use. What we're seeing today is a surging interest and appreciation for forest goods from tropical to temperate, rural to urban, north to south, and among all classes of society. There's renewed appreciation of nutrient-dense foods, wild over-cultivated, native cuisine, ethical sourcing, and regional identity. Focus on internationally traded forest goods can overshadow the massive importance of non-wood forest products in local and regional trade. Local and regional markets are larger in value and size than global trade and generate greater benefits for local groups while avoiding elite capture and the instability of international markets. The photo on the right is of a Verapazo market in Belen, Brazil, the site of an immense assemblage of biodiversity. A vibrant collection of thousands of species and products includes fish, game, plant medicines, fruits, fibers, bark, seeds, roots, and musical instruments created from forest goods. The most significant contribution of non-wood forest products is daily use for subsistence. This is where NTFPs escape statistics. Their contribution to food security and healthcare is staggering and yet little studied by Western science. Forest goods contribute not only to survival, but provide high quality seasonal greens, fruits, mushrooms, and spices, and a wide array of effective medicines that enhance well being and quality of life. In this photo, Neck and Morocco are showing some of the medicines they use, including angiroba oil for sprains and wound care. When COVID 19 hit their community, they relied on forest-based medicine, particularly oils and barks from forest trees. Wild foods offer such a critical connection between people and their cultures. We will now go on a worldwide tour of food ways. Food is found at the intersection of culture and nature. It grows from the wisdom of generations, a blend of inherited knowledge, and the innovations of farmers, hunters, gatherers and cooks. Traditional foodways are complex, seasonally varied and interwoven with biologically diverse environments. Food distills a range of social, political and ecological relations. In La Milpa, 
se manifiestan y ejercen un montón de derechos humanos de, estas, de estos colectivos, ¿no? como es el derecho a la vida, como es el derecho a la identidad cultural, el derecho al trabajo, el derecho a la alimentación sana, el derecho de acceder a los recursos naturales tradicionalmente manejados, el territorio, la autonomía. No se trata de producir por producir, se trata de vivir bien. But few traditional foodways remain intact in our world today. And most are under serious threat. Many communities are working to change this story. They're slowing the pace of change, shoring up and celebrating what they know and have, and maintaining healthy, secure and diverse diets. The Traditional Foodways program supports traditional food systems in their entirety. The sustainable harvesting. Management, cultivation, processing and preparation of an astonishing range and number of food species and the cultural landscapes of which they are a part. We value the diversity in objectives and approaches, typical to traditional management systems, food for one's family, health, food security, taste. To any occasion when a happiness on traditional marriage, we must cook this traditional meal. Well-being celebration. Mole con el choc. Es el platillo tradicional de de aquella región de Filotepe. Cash from markets. Our work builds on the complementary strengths of Western science and traditional knowledge. It bridges scales and links individuals, communities, and organizations, sharing lessons, experiences, and methods. We undertake community driven research produce knowledge exchange tools, manuals, recipe exchanges and videos, work on sustainable harvesting and management, nurseries, seed exchanges, and celebrate traditional foodways through cultural revival festivals, wild food tastings, traditional games, and music. We hold village-based workshops and exchanges and school programs that includes sharing stories from elders. All our work involves children, the future of communities. Traditional foodways and cultural landscapes are in their hands. Help us celebrate and conserve extraordinary and threatened cultures and environments around the world. Today, Non-wood forest products are more important than ever to help curb biodiversity loss and climate change. One million species are at risk of extinction. With only the last 30 years, native terrestrial species abundance has dropped 20%. Natural forests in the tropics hold 40 times more carbon than plantations. Conservation of forests and non-wood forest products is an effective, low-cost way to store carbon and promote food security through multiple use management. This urgent planetary emergency requires policy and laws which are pro-forest and pro-non-wood forest products, which ensure communities land and resource rights and recognize their customary laws. We need to listen to the voices of producers, harvesters, and traders who are often marginalized from policy discussions. To date, policy and laws have often favored timber and large agricultural commodities, and within the NWFP sector, they tend to favor the industrial and large scale over the small scale and traditional. Ironically, subsidies and incentives are often directed toward production systems that rely less upon and can even diminish biodiversity rather than those that are local, traditional, small, and biologically and culturally diverse. Biodiversity loss and climate change will not be solved by policy alone. We need local action and a transformation of research and education to address our current crisis. The incentive structure for research and publications in academia, however, can lead to top-down extractive research that does not always respond to the priorities and needs of communities. 
A recent example of an effective approach to global challenge is the medical community's response to COVID-19. Expedited peer review and collaborations across disciplines to develop a vaccine in record-breaking time. As the vital signs of the earth falter, we need to thoughtfully and collaboratively pursue projects which will yield concrete benefits to land and people and address the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity loss. Indigenous and local knowledge associated with the management, harvesting, processing, and use of non-wood forest products is a critical part of people's relationship with forests and landscapes and helps build resiliency in the face of dramatic social, economic, and climate change. Western science can complement traditional knowledge, in some cases strengthening the power of local people to make informed decisions about land use. In this image, this Kaipo Indian is looking at a page illustrating the kilos of game caught underneath a variety of species of trees. He's discovering that Pikia, the tree that Kurumi studied, is tops in calling game. A few hunters in his village captured 232 kilos of game under Pikia during its brief flowering season. Since loggers were paying $2 for an entire tree at the time, and the edible meat from the captured game would have cost the equivalent of $526 at the book butchers, villagers decided it was best to negotiate and save Pikia. Wouldn't we all like to be greeted this way? This is the joyful reception that Christina De Silva of the National Council of Extractivist Population received upon arriving to offer a workshop on the value of forest to human health in an extractive reserve in the Brazilian Amazon. We need to support and train spirited mentors who can convey the ecological and cultural significance of forests and teach about the value of forest goods. But where are they? We are in an era of what has been called the extinction of experience. As Barry Lopez noted, something strange and dangerous is afoot. Year by year, the number of people with experience in the land diminishes. However, one of the ways to combat this trend is through culture and connecting to place. Cultural identity can generate social trust and resilience in the face of adversity. This is a photo of an octa child capturing the hunting traditions of his indigenous tribe in the Philippines. The National Museum of the Philippines now has a permanent exhibit of Octa and the Grito lifeways. Time spent with elders is now counted as time spent in formal school, allowing for the intergenerational transmission of knowledge. These changes came about as a result of greater proximity between government officials and indigenous groups by policymakers attending and participating in cultural rival festivals. This diagram represents the rupture between culture and nature that is occurring in many parts of the industrialized world. This disconnect between people and nature is serious and threatens human health and our earth. Non-wood forest products can be an effective means to bridge the divide and bring people closer to nature. At a time when we desperately need ecologically literate citizens, schooling in many parts of the world is standardized, homogenized, and globalized with students graduating with no knowledge of the land, flora, or fauna. It's estimated that citizens in the U.S. spend 90% of their time indoors, much of which is on screens. As Ralph Waldo Emerson noted in 1844, we are shut up in schools for 10 to 15 years. We come out with a belly full of words and do not know a thing. We cannot use our hands or our legs or our eyes or our arms. We do not know an edible roof in the woods. To counter this trend, I would like you to invite you to step into the woods in this photo where I work with students who help store the forest and boost ecological literacy. After this forest visit, we will close with a song, Logico Ecologico, sung by Gloria Gaia, which recounts the profound sadness of losing forests, fruits, and wildlife to logging, ranching, and fire. Welcome to Ridgeview Woods. I thought we'd been on the screen a long time and we're speaking about forest products. We might want to get off the screen and into the woods. So we're here near my home in Princeton, New Jersey. New Jersey is the most densely populated state in the United States. It's under tremendous development pressures. Those are different than what we see in Brazil and other places around the world, but they're relentless also. This forest 
was slated to be bifurcated by a natural gas pipeline. There's also a lot of pressure to build homes in Princeton on the remaining lots. Princeton is largely built out. There's two beautiful forests left of any size, large size, older growth, unprotected, which are under threat. So it's kind of incomprehensible that in a place with as much education and affluence as even here, it would even thought of to remove those forests for homes. What we've been doing in this forest is to try to build up that knowledge you need to bring back a forest. This forest was completely covered with invasive species. They were 12 foot high. So this is the result of 10 years of work on the part of Princeton High School students and other volunteers to remove the invasives, and we uncover this remarkable diversity of native species and non-wood forest products that have protein and also greens and fruit, maple syrup, medicines like witch hazel, and they all have stories and legends and lore about them that enchant the forest. They make the forest an amazing place to be. We need to completely respect and revere the nature that is left. We need to learn about it and we need to pass that along to our children. It's important to boost our ecological literacy, to remove the digital devices for some period of time, and to get back in the woods and reconnect with nature. When we began, I asked you to recall the first wild edible that blooms near your home. And here, I wanna share the one that blooms near us, it looks like cabbage and it smells like skunk and it's called skunk cabbage. Thank you for visiting Ridgeview Woods. Lá vai a paca, a cuti o aracuã. Vai, vai, viado, foi tão belo teu passado, é tão triste o amanhã. Lá vai a rara, a arirane, a capivara. Vai, vai, mucura, tão acabando a mata escura, tão acabando a zimbiara. Quero ver a onça, só se for pintada. Quero ver coruja, só embalsamada. E cadê a bicharada? Tá fugindo da queimada, tá fugindo da espingada. Lá vai o rio, tocantins ameaçado. Vai com coragem, não permita que a barragem te faça ficar parado. Lá vai a mata se deitando pelo chão. Mata sem pernas, tua base enraizada, tu não podes fugir, não. Excellent. I think this was a presentation prepared by uh, Mrs. Shani. Is there uh, another word you would like to add to this? Or uh, I think it's a reflection of all the people I work with around the world, both in the Brazilian Amazon and Indonesia and here in the US. And I think all over the world we're facing these problems. I think non-wood forest products have a really critical role to play in bringing culture and nature closer and allowing us to sustainably use our forests. So I'm really thrilled to see this initiative. It's remarkable. I think it's working on exactly what we need to work on. And I think Europea, Europe is in front that way and looking at very detailed changes to regulations and to our relationship with the land that can move forward a sustainable future. So I really am excited about the Incredibles Network. Thank you. Well, I, I think we have to thank you for a fascinating presentation, a fascinating um, video that you have prepared. It, it's clear it's not only a lot of, of effort that it has taken, but it, it, I think we could all feel the love you have for forests and for this non-forest uh, non wood uh, products. Uh, you've been taking us on a wonderful and a fascinating journey, showing the richness of uh, what forests can offer, what this non-wood forest products are about. So thank you so much for this. Um, what I would like to suggest, taking a look at the time, we definitely would like to give uh, the participants the opportunity to ask questions to you. Now, the way to organize this 
it's probably it's probably best if you do it as follows. If you could stay with us until the end of this session, yeah, then I would like to invite the participants. Please do not use the chat function to address or state your questions. Use the Q&A section, as explained at the beginning of this session, uh, and make it clear that your question is directed to uh, Mrs. Patricia Shenley. And in the meantime, as you are posting your questions, we will proceed with the next section, which is basically about showing yet other perspectives of uh, from value chains and adding to basically demonstrating this richness and diversity of non-good forest products. And at the end of this session, um, we hope that uh, the people from the API team, uh, EFI team, they will have scanned through uh, all the questions that have come in and they will select a couple of them that we then can uh, offer also to you, Mrs. Shelley. Is that a good way for you to proceed? That sounds Excellent. great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your excellent contribution. I think it has been a wonderful experience for all of us to uh, to witness this, basically. And I see that uh, Sarah has raised her hand. Sarah, yeah, please. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Just also a note that if you have any technical questions or any um, comments about the functionality of the webinar, you can write those now in the chat. I've enabled the chat function, which wasn't enabled before. Um, so please keep the Q&A box for your questions to our speakers so that we can manage it a little bit more easily. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, I can even say that this uh, chat functionality has already been used to signal to me that my camera has been sliding away. So I hope it's, uh, it should be okay for the rest of the session. And my apologies for that. Now, so as stated, we will now proceed with this uh, next time slot, which is on perspectives, showing yet other perspectives from the value chains, the richness and diversity of non wood forest products. If you have questions for Mrs. Uh, Shandy, please put them in the question and answers, and we will come back uh, to them uh, and revisit these questions at the end of this session. But for now, I would like to invite our next speaker, who basically will give a presentation on, on Cork. And the next speaker is João Rui Ferreira, and he's the president at APCOR, and that is the Portuguese Cork Association. And furthermore, he's also the CEO of Valdemar Fernandes da Silva. So, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Ferreira, I give the floor to you, and well, you can give a presentation. Please go ahead. You're muted. Good morning, Stephen. I believe you can hear me well. Good Thanks. morning, everyone. And my first words are, of course, to thank you for the invitation and to congratulate for the initiative. It's been an amazing uh, session until now, and I hope I can continue, and uh, it's really inspiring. So I'm here to talk about uh, really and a true example of what is a non-wood forest product. Uh, I'd like to thank you also the Portuguese Minister of Environment for the, the clear reference he made to Cork, and I hope I can give you a more wide perspective on what is our sector. I'm start sharing my screen. I believe you can see it now as a, in a full screen. So Cork is real example of uh, where we can combine culture, nature, and of course, always looking at the future. Of course, many of you know Cork and you use Cork and you see Cork in a daily base while you can see in a product as a Cork stopper. So it's been used for centuries, started by Dom Perignon uh, that discovered that cork was the best way to close a, a bottle of wine. And you see different and wide uses of uh, cork stoppers in different wines, in different bottles, and almost in every wine region in the world. It's by far the most known and the most added value use of cork in our, in our sector. It has a clear preference from winemakers to consumers. And today we are talking about more than 12 billion cork stoppers that are used yearly by the wine industry. So this means that, for example, from Portugal to the world, we export 40 million cork stoppers a day. So imagine if we can translate this to opening wine bottles in a daily base, 40 million cork stoppers made from Portuguese cork are opened every day in the world. 
and the, the preference of the professionals that have seven of, the, of 10 bottles use cork, so 70% market share. There's also a huge uh, preference by consumers. Consumers of wine, consumers of different uh, alcoholic beverages and different beverages really prefer cork. They love a natural product between them and the wine, an heritage product as well. And this is probably the longest marriage we have been seeing in from two sectors in the world over the last centuries and years. But cork is not only are not only cork stoppers. Today, cork can be seen in a vari in a wide variety of applications, from construction, where you can see in the facades, in the roofs, in the flooring, to other applications, more architectonic, more in oriented to engineer, but widely used today for thermal, acoustic, insulation characteristics that cork can deliver to buildings and constructions. And you, as you can see in other applications like foreign uh, wall coverings, decoration, textile, shoes, leather, many, many uses that you can see cork from the most renowned brands in the world, for the more sports oriented, you can see cork in a vast wide uh, applications, for example, in automotive industry, in the NASA aerospatial program, in transport due to this lightness, to this capacity to reduce consumption of energy. And so you can see a huge and a, a big potential to growth over the next decade. Today, we estimate that the global business is around and a little bit more than 1.5 billion euros. So it's a European based sector that exports to almost every part of the world where there is wine production or where there is construction or any other application. And we see a huge potential in the growth of this. In this graph, you can see the cumulative exports from the top five European countries that export cork to other parts of the world. And you can see in the last decade, this uh, compound average growth rate of 4.2% every year. So today we passed 1.5 billion euros in exports from European countries to the world. Europe is by far the world leader in exports. Portugal leads these exports with almost two thirds of the cumulative of these numbers. And we see, as I said, a huge growth potential aligned with consumers and professionals preferences on the sustainability credentials of cork products. But cork starts much beyond this. And cork is also an heritage that I believe and I see as we are the guardians of this beautiful and amazing ecosystem, the cork oak forests, a tree that exists in this part of the world for more than 10 million years, very well adapted to the climate conditions. Cork oak forests are located in the West Mediterranean basin. They account for more than 2.1 million hectares and they have a huge steel potential to grow mostly in the north part of Africa. It's really an agroforest and a multifunctional system where you can find different uses from agricultural systems to pasture systems to forest systems. Cork is really the most and renowned example, the most added value uh, product that we can extract, but this is really a good example where we can have different outputs from this ecosystem. As mentioned before, it's one of the hotspots of biodiversity in the world, compared with some of the most renowned like Amazonia, Brunel Forest. And this one is located in, in Europe, protecting 37 species of animals, a lot of birds, 24 reptiles, and a lot of, lot of species. As mentioned also previously, and this, this photo was take, is taken in in, uh, in, uh, in Tunisia, you can see it's really the last barrier against Europe desertification. Cork forests improve soils organic matter, contribute to regulate the hydrological cycle while acting as a deterrent against soil desertification. Imagine how important also this is to the territorial and social cohesion. It also provides a wide variety of ecosystem services that are public goods, many of them without from the uh, until today economic value. And fortunately, there is a lot of work being done on that local and in, in European base. 
And according to Ecopol project, we can see that only considering three ecosystem services, carbon sequestration, soil conservation and nutrient retention, we can estimate that the, the value of this ecosystem can account for close to 180 million euros per year. As I said, it's also a very important social impact. It's one of the world best paid agricultural jobs, and it accounts, according to WWF, to more than 100,000 direct jobs. So, to finish, I say this is the true example of an European sector that proves that we can have a productive forest with environmental and social protection, aligned with European bioeconomy ambition and an example for a sustainable worldwide European leadership. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope I, can, I could pass the message. Thank you and congratulations again. Excellent, Mr. Ferreira, and thank you for respecting and, and presenting your uh, presentation, delivering your speech within the time frame uh, uh, allotted to you. So thank you so much for a very interesting presentation, again showing the richness of this wonderful, exceptional product that is Cork. So let's immediately move on to the next speaker. And again, I would like to restate people having questions for either Mr. Ferreira or also for Mrs. Shandy, please post them in the Q&A and we will uh, check, see through these questions as they are coming in and select a couple of those that we will treat uh, at the end of this uh, uh, session. But for now, let's move on to the next contribution we have. And the next contribution will be given by basically uh, the president, uh, the honorary president of what is called the Groupement Européen de Truffes et Trufficulture and uh, of the French Federation of uh, Trufficultures. And uh, his name is Jean-Charles Savignac. And rather than delivering a speech in persona, he has prepared a video, which we are quite happy to share with you. Gerard, can you activate the video, please? Je suis très heureux de m'exprimer dans cette magnifique réunion, mais je vais aborder surtout ce matin les aspects économiques et sociaux de la culture et de la récolte des truffes et de la trufficulture, et vous allez voir que c'est assez impressionnant. Alors je commence d'abord par les aspects économiques pour dire qu'il y a des retombées très importantes dans la récolte et la production de truffes. Euh, les, la truffe est liée à un arbre et euh, le, le fait qu'on qu la trouve va, va, et qu'on la commercialise génère des, des centaines de millions d'euros en Europe actuellement. Il faut avoir conscience de cela. Il y a des conséquences qui sont à la fois euh, liées directement à ce phénomène de la culture et de la production de la truffe, et puis il y a des conséquences indirectes économiques très importantes aussi. C'est un facteur de développement important pour plusieurs régions de, de l'Europe. Alors évidemment, euh, l'activité économique, c'est d'abord la, la production des truffes, la récolte dans les forêts, et pour ça, donc, il faut faire un travail du sol, parce qu'il faut que le sol soit assez souple, il faut également euh, de l'eau, il faut également euh, apporter le moment venu des plants et entretenir le sol pendant des années avant que la production euh, commence, dans la forêt ou à côté de la forêt éventuellement, mais on fait une plantation quasiment forestière. Hein. Donc une fois qu'on a fait ce travail du sol, il faut faire des installations tout autour, et tout ça, ça génère une activité économique, de la vie économique et euh, un chiffre d'affaires qui, qui est assez important, il y a une valeur ajoutée, on, on l'a estimé en Europe euh, à 300 millions d'euros à peu près, 300-400 millions d'euros pour, globalement pour l'Europe, mais c'est un phénomène sensible. Hein. Alors, indirectement, il y a beaucoup d'activités qui sont liées à la truffe, parce qu'une fois qu'on a récolté la truffe, avec l'aide de chiens, donc il y a tout un commerce d'alimentation du chien aussi qui, qui est derrière, il va falloir les vendre, les apporter sur des marchés, et euh, naturellement, ça crée de la vie, euh, une, une vie sociale importante, j'y reviendrai. Et on, on a aussi une préparation de la commercialisation des truffes, des, des ventes dans des, dans des épiceries, euh, dans des commerces, dans des marchés. Il y a l'expédition. Alors, surtout, il y a les conserves de truffes. Il y a des préparations spécialisées à la truffe. Il y a toute une activité commerciale, des charcuteries et naturellement la restauration. Les, les restaurants utilisent de la truffe. C'est un produit de qualité extrêmement apprécié. Et euh, on, on peut dire que même dans certaines zones, c'est un produit phare pour la gastronomie. Hein. Voilà, tout, tout ceci montre qu'il y a des retombées économiques pour la truffe et qui sont liées à, ce, à cette récolte des truffes. J'ajoute que s'est développé autour de la truffe toute une série d'autres activités, notamment de l'agritourisme, des visites d'exploitation, de plantations, de forêts truffières, 
avec l'accueil de personnes les week-ends dans des gîtes, euh, dans, dans des hôtels ruraux. Euh, et il y a aussi des, des visites qui sont organisées. Euh, et également, on, on, on s'est mis à créer depuis les années 80 des, des maisons de la truffe, des musées de la truffe. Et donc, ça suscite aussi des voyages, des visites dans les campagnes. Et je n'oublie pas qu'il y a aussi des publications, euh, des, des journaux. Euh, voilà, il y a toute une vie économique euh, qui est liée à la production de truffes et, de, et à la trufficulture. Ça, c'était le premier aspect que je voulais souligner ce matin. Le deuxième aspect, c'est la vie sociale. On en parle moins, c'est plus difficile évidemment à quantifier, mais quand même, les, les récoltes de truffes et la trufficulture vont générer là aussi des activités sociales qui sont importantes et qui sont importantes à la fois au plan individuel et au plan collectif. Alors, au plan individuel, la, la truffe et la, la récolte de la truffe, la trufficulture ont comme conséquence de, de lutter contre l'isolement. En milieu rural, c'est très important, cela permet un enracinement local. C'est aussi des valeurs de protection du milieu naturel. On, on doit respecter la nature pour récolter les, les, les truffes. Il faut un travail attentif des trufficulteurs. Il y a également chez eux, chez les trufficulteurs, le souci du progrès, une formation personnelle. Et j'allais dire même qu'il y a une continuité entre les générations. Voilà quelques aspects sociaux individuels. Alors, entre l'individuel et le collectif, il y a un aspect essentiel qu'il faut mettre en avant, c'est l'emploi. La, la trufficulture, la récolte des truffes, cela génère des emplois. Combien Il y a des emplois qui sont à temps plein, d'autres qui sont à temps partiel. Il y en a qui sont à certains moments de l'année, d'autres pendant toute l'année. Voilà. Mais globalement, les, les trufficulteurs, lorsque nous y réfléchissions dans le cadre du groupement européen Truffes et Trufficulture, nous estimions que pour toute l'Europe, hein, toute l'Europe, l'Espagne, la, la France, l'Italie, mais, mais aussi de, 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 tous les autres pays de l'ancienne de, 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 de Yougoslavie, eh bien, il, il y a à peu près... 100 000 emplois qui sont directement ou indirectement, à temps partiel ou à temps plein, liés à la truffe. C'est quand même quelque chose de considérable. Mais l'aspect social essentiel, c'est aussi la vie collective qui est attachée à la trufficulture. Je, je voudrais dire que la, la, la trufficulture, la récolte des truffes, ça apporte une vie sociale dans les localités rurales en hiver. Et, et ça, c'est quelque chose, un aspect à, à retenir. Il y a un facteur d'animation, la, la vie des marchés, les fêtes à la truffe également, tout, tout ceci entraîne des repas qui sont pris en commun et euh, ce, ce, cela permet d'avoir une vie là, là où normalement la, la campagne est plutôt calme pendant l'hiver. Alors j'ajoute sur l'aspect social que la trufficulture entraîne une vie collective dans les organisations des producteurs, des récoltants de truffes. Il y a à la fois des, des associations qui s'occupent des truffes, il y a des syndicats de producteurs de truffes, donc ils tiennent des réunions, ils font des formations, ils ont des réunions dans les départements, dans les provinces, au niveau national également, même au niveau européen. Et, et donc, nous, nous, nous avons euh, une vie de l'organisation des trufficulteurs. À cela se rajoute aussi un aspect plus plaisant, ce sont les confréries qui défendent la, les qualités de la truffe, les, les bonnes truffes. Voilà. Ce, tout, tout ceci euh, crée finalement des manifestations à la campagne, mais aussi à la vie. Nous avons en Espagne l'exemple de Truforum, qui est une manifestation exceptionnelle dans, de, dans des villes. Et euh, il y a dans d'autres villes de France, d'Italie, il y a des cités de la truffe en Italie. Tout ceci crée une vie importante autour de la truffe. Voilà. Et puis surtout, je voudrais dire que sur le plan social, la, la truffe, c'est aussi l'illustration et la défense d'une gastronomie exceptionnelle qui soutient les restaurateurs dans les grandes villes, dans les capitales aussi. Et ce, tout ceci est précieux. Pour clore sur cet aspect collectif, je, social, je dirais que la truffe, c'est un ciment social et euh, il faut retenir cet aspect. Et pour conclure, finalement, ce que je voulais dire à tout le monde ce matin, c'est que la truffe et la trufficulture, finalement, ce sont des facteurs positifs pour la ruralité, pour le développement euh, local, mais c'est aussi euh, quelque chose qui entraîne des exigences de qualité du produit et euh, également euh, une authenticité du produit. Voilà, autant de raisons pour soutenir et développer la truffe et la trufficulture. Well, I would like to thank Mr. Savignac for this excellent uh, contribution, and we were more than happy that he was uh, willing to prepare this video and that we could uh, then provide the subtitles to make it uh, basically possible for you to all of you uh, to, to hear his uh, story and, and point of view. Now, we've been listening to contributions on cork and truffles, and these are essentially two of the five products that are considered in the, in, uh, the incredible project, uh, that are considered as one of these uh, INETs, basically, in the framework of this innovation network approach. 
We have another product, so let's continue our tour. The other product is uh, resin. And in order to have, uh, a, fit, uh, in order to have uh, a close look at the perspective of resin, let's uh, introduce Mrs. Uh, Mariana Jorge Ferreira from Luresina, Luresa Resina. And she's not only uh, active in resin, but she is also uh, a well appreciated member of the advisory board of uh, the incredible project. Mrs. Ferreira, the floor is yours. So we're switching to Mrs. Ferreira. Yes, she's <laughs> muted now. Good morning, everybody. I'm sorry, I had some technical problems, but solved. Um, no problem. I will uh, try to share my screen. Now. Can you see my screen correctly? Absolutely. Yes, it looks good. I will start then. Good morning, everyone. I would like to start by thanking the organizers of this event for the opportunity to speak in this forum about the potential of natural resin. Resin, as you all know, is a viscous, a sticky substance that some trees expel as defense mechanism to an external aggression. In this case, we are talking about pine trees and pine oleo resin, what we generally call natural resin, is used as raw material for the chemical industry being one branch of the so-called pine chemicals. We generally call tapping or tapping activity to the harvesting of natural resin, the operation that a person carries out to collect natural resin from live pine trees. This pine oleo resin is then subject to first industrial transformation and by physical processes, you get two main products, gum rosin, the solid part of resin, the sticky part, and gum turpentine, the liquid volatile part. These two products are then further transformed and widely used in the chemical industry. The other two branches of pine chemicals refer to products obtained by chemical processes from pine stumps and byproducts of the paper industry. The main difference between them is precisely the fact that our branch, natural resin, concerns a resource obtained from living trees, living forests, while the other two depend on logging and chemical processes to obtain similar derivatives. On the other hand, you can also get comparable synthetic products based on fossil fuels and use them in the same kind of applications as pine chemicals. But what applications are we referring to? What is natural resin used for? Well, if you look around you right now, starting with the computer you are using, the adhesive of the label on the water bottle you're about to drink from, the printing ink you used to print today's event program, the chewing gum that you're chewing to calm your nerves before this presentation, or the scent that you used to perfume yourself early this morning, all of them may have natural resin in it. And you can find it in many more products of your daily life, and probably you don't even imagine it comes from natural resin. The applications are countless. Natural resin is harvested all around the world. The tapping techniques are different from country to country, from region to region. The tools and the stimulants used are different. The industrial transformation processes are different. And of course, each pine species provides a unique special type of pine oleo resin with singular chemical properties. Brazilian's Eliotigum rosin is much appreciated because it doesn't crystallize. Portuguese pinea turpentine is rich in limonene. Chinese Masoniana gum rosin is known by its versatility, and Spanish pinaster turpentine has a particular rotatory properties. Just to give you a few examples. So within this diversity and this richness, there is always room for innovation, for a new application, for a new technique, for further improvement and continuous development. And all these are essential to guarantee natural resin's sustainability. Speaking about sustainability, the relevance of natural resin within the three pillars of sustainable development, people, planet and profit, seems rather obvious, but should be reminded anyway. 
Natural resin is a renewable natural product harvested with respectful techniques, promoting correct forest management and allowing multi-purpose multi forest uses and biodiversity. Tapping activity is held by tapping workers, and so it depends entirely on labor. It depends on people. It promotes the setting of people in rural areas, providing a secure income for many families. It is inclusive. It contributes to the forest's management. It helps in fire and plague prevention, in environmental con conservation and territorial cohesion. Natural resin is raw material for many products of our daily use, and it must be recognized and valued for its contribution to society, environment, and economy. A couple of weeks ago, I received a message from a colleague here present with a link to an article from a local newspaper about some surprising findings during an archeological excavation in a prehistorical site. One of these findings referred to a ceramic pot that contained pitch, which is basically heated or burnt natural resin, a kind of rough gum resin. This archaeological site is located within one of the most important tapping areas in the center of Spain, in the heart of Castilla y León, in the surroundings, in the surroundings of what we call Un Pueblo Resinero, a tapping village. And it's just about eight kilometers from the industrial plant where my company operates today. The conclusions, as mentioned in this article, were that the landscape at that time was not so different from the landscape today, that the land uses by then were similar to nowadays land uses. That within this settlement, about 3,200 years ago, during Bronze Age, we could already find tapping activity and tapping workers, and that these people already knew about natural resin's properties. It is known that the use of natural resin is previous to historical registers. There are records from Egypt and ancient Greece, but to find such solid evidence from the prehistorical age right next door is absolutely overwhelming, as you may imagine. And I ask myself, is there a better way to show natural resin's potential than to acknowledge that it is part of the European cultural landscape and traditional land use since prehistorical times till today? Natural resin has always been a part of Europe's green economy and it will still be in the future, for sure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana, for an excellent presentation, guiding us or giving us an introduction basically to this fascinating world of uh, resin. Um, here also, I would like to ask participants, if you have a question for uh, Mrs. Ferreira, please drop it in the Q&A section of this Zoom webinar facility, and we will check these questions coming in as they are coming in. And at the end of this session, we will make a little bit of time to uh, address the questions or the selection of these. So that applies to the questions you might have for Mrs. Ferreira, but also to the previous uh, speakers, obviously. So, well, let us proceed after resin. There's still another uh, non-wood forest work that, that we would like to highlight. And the next one is basically, well, nuts, chestnuts. And for this, we have a video that has been basically uh, prepared by Mr. Jesus Crisaga. Uh, and he's the president of IXP Castagna de Galicia. So, yes, Shira, you can launch the video, please. Hola, soy Jesús Quinta García, el presidente de la Indicación Geográfica Protegida Castaña de Galicia y administrador único de la empresa Libros Galicia, que se dedica a la transformación de producto al pelado, sobre todo al pelado de castaña. La producción de la castaña en Europa supera las 210.000 toneladas. Esto supone un 10% de la producción mundial, pero el 97% de la producción de castaña sativa europea eh, se produce en Europa. En los años 60 se producía más del doble de esta cantidad, más de 460.000 eh, toneladas. Eh, los principales países de productores de Europa son Italia, Francia, Portugal y España. Eh, 
que suponen más del 70% de la, de la producción europea. La producción tiene lugar en sistemas mixtos agroforestales o como se dice en el norte de España, se denominan sotos, que es considerado un hábitat de interés comunitario por la Unión Europea y proporciona múltiples sistemas ambientales a la sociedad. Es un sector que proporciona importantes recursos en la economía de medio rural y en áreas de montaña, no solo en el ámbito primario, sino en el industrial. Y la castaña es un producto silvestre, sano, equilibrado, para una dieta mmm, fundamentalmente sana. Es un producto totalmente natural, que se produce en zonas de montaña, en zonas aisladas, en zonas donde fija mucho la población rural. Solo en España hay unos 100.000 castañicultores y decenas de empresas que se dedican a la transformación del producto, eh, que proporcionan empleo en las zonas rurales. Este esquema eh, se repite en el resto de países europeos con Italia a la cabeza. En España se encuentra sobre todo en el noroeste de España, donde se concentra más de la mitad de la, de la producción. Sin embargo, el castaño presenta diferentes amenazas, como plagas, enfermedades, que aunque la investigación proporciona soluciones, los recursos para la lucha nos parecen insuficientes. Tenemos que apostar más por esta lucha para que el castaño sobreviva. Tenemos el reto de impulsar las nuevas plantaciones, profesionalizar el sector con variedades de alto interés económico, variedades que tienen unas características especiales para su comercialización, con el objeto de competir con castaña de otras procedencias asiáticas, que son otras especies de menor calidad, de peor comportamiento, y este reto eh, tenemos que conseguirlo entre todos porque ser, será muy beneficioso para la economía rural, que es lo que al final eh, eh, prima una sostenibilidad ambiental que también es importante y eh, de cara a un mercado en verde europeo, pues este producto es totalmente interesante y que nos parece que puede ayudar mucho a, a la economía verde de Europa. También tenemos el reto de impulsar el, el consumo del producto, el consumo en los mercados tanto de fresco como los productos industriales que se emplean en las diferentes cocinas mundiales e impulsar la producción, impulsar a estos productores que que, que tienen que producir esa materia prima que necesitamos para nuestro tejido industrial y seguir aumentando el tejido industrial con la elaboración de diferentes productos. Por eso desde, desde el sector eh, demandamos a las diferentes administraciones, tanto autonómicas, eh, nacionales, europeas, que nos ayuden a, a conseguir estos retos y a luchar contra las plagas que tenemos recientemente, como es la vispilla, como es el chancro del castaño, como es la tinta y, y en, creo que las administraciones se tienen que volcar eh, un poco más en esto en general porque es un sector que está bastante olvidado. Por lo tanto, me gustaría agradecer al señor Kessler Quinta por este excelente video showing yet uh, another product of this number of uh, forest products. Um, the final product we would like to highlight are aromatic and medicinal plants. And for this, we have with, with us Mr. Hamed Ali Hassan from the Ministry of Agriculture of Tunisia. Uh, Mr. Hassan, could you please uh, initiate your presentation? Thank you. Thank you for the organizers. Thank you, uh, everyone. And I'm very happy to, to be with you for uh, at the end of this incredible project. I don't know if you see can see me. Not, uh, not yet. Not yet. So I try to to share my screen also. And It's okay now? Yes, it is okay now. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay, I can start. So. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, my presentation, as said, is about the values and potential of medicinal and aromatic plants. And uh, as uh, you know, the, the this uh, map value chain is well known by the high diversity of plants uh, as said by the previous uh, uh, 
speaker, there are about uh, 300, uh, 3,300 plants in international trade. So that uh, can, uh, you, you can show the important importance of its diversity in different uh, countries and especially in Mediterranean countries. Some of these plants are uh, undervalorized and others are uh, overexploited. Uh, the second uh, characteristic of the medicinal and aromatic uh, plants value chain is the high growth uh, of global trade or and the global market. So uh, you can, you will see in the uh, next slide that the growth rate, uh, annual growth rate, is more than uh, five percent at international uh, trade. So medicinal and aromatic plants are used for four types of uh, processed natural products. Firstly, essential oils, fresh plant material, dried plant material, plant extracts and oleoresins. And uh, the, um, uh, for essential oils, they are used uh, for one third for food one third for uh, spa and relaxation and others for medical uses and cleaning and home. Uh, other characteristic of these uh, PAM uh, uh, products or MAP products are uh, the difficulty to dis distinguish between wild and cultivated material. So many, many wild materials become dom domesticated for com competitiveness and uh, integration uh, in the value chain. So here for an example of uh, rosemary uh, uh, in Tunisia and uh, rosemary olive oil, uh, sorry, essential oil. Uh, as uh, presented by uh, in the incredible project, this is the value chain. You can see that these, it's very, uh, there are many actors from forest manager to uh, end use industries. And uh, if you see at the uh, upstream of the, this value chain, it's uh, very informal, especially at uh, for the collectors. And we, when we uh, end by the, and use industries, we have more structured uh, uh, enterprises. And uh, the most share of this, uh, the value added is obtained at the end of this value chain. The information uh, about trade is uh, 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 we can have it for essential oils. And uh, here we can see that uh, India is one of the main uh, exporters, uh, followed by the US uh, and, uh, and China. Uh, for, for Mediterranean countries, we can see France by 8%, Italy and Spain for 3%, uh, but also other Mediterranean countries that counts for 1% like uh, Morocco, Egypt, Tunisia, and uh, uh, other countries. Uh, but as I said, that uh, the interest uh, by uh, natural products uh, and uses a high increase in exports for different countries, like uh, you can see uh, for Europe, the uh, expanding uh, annual growth rate with 8.54% for the period 2015-2019. Uh, the same for uh, Maghreb countries, and uh, you, you can see it's about it's more than 10% for uh, Tunisia, uh, uh, etc., and also Italy and Spain. Uh, the United States, followed by France and Germany, are the leading importers. This is uh, the essential oils are then used for different uh, uh, and use uh, industries uh, like cosmetics, etc. 
so following the SWOT analysis that was done by the incredible project, we can see the main challenges for this uh, uh, value chain is how to stay competitive and respond to market demand changes, ensure sufficient and equitable returns, especially for collectors and secure sustainable supply of medicinal and aromatic plants. And for that, there are three main orientation strategies. The first one is networking. Networking is needed to share the flow of information and share returns, etc. Market development also, because there are many uh, uh, changes uh, in the market at international level, and uh, there are um, niche markets, the, 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 um, the rural market, rural uh, market, etc. So, or local market. So we have to develop some uh, actions to uh, focus on them. And the the last orientation strategy is the sustainable supply we have to uh, uh, we have to uh, um, have a harvest lower than the uh, equilibrium production so firstly how networking can add value and benefits we should develop partnership between different actors so through contract arrangement with, with between local communities and forest administration, creation of producers association, development of clusters between landowners, collectors, and industry or uh, and consumers. For market development, we need we need to change existing processes and uh, introduce new techniques for better quality development of final production, productions, especially through certification and the creation of niche market. We should also work on local territories and scenarios with tourists. And for sustainable production, we have to enter the new methods for forest management and uh, these methods should take into account all non-wood forest products and five more minutes yeah okay so the main key messages we have for map value chain can, and it can be enhanced through a demand dri driven approach targeting final products with high added value we should promote networking between different actors looking for domes more domestic buyers to develop local economy and uh, one important point is to develop data and information flow, knowledge de development through science and innovation. And this is will help for to know how are the market requirements, what, what are the, main, the species extracts and uses the surface area and quality to be competitive. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Hassan, for your uh, very nice introduction to the fascinating world of aromatics and medicinal plants. Uh, it's through a very special uh, subsector of the non wood forest products. So what we will do now, we will give the people from the EFI uh, uh, team a couple of minutes to uh, sort out the questions. We still have time, or you still have time to post a couple of questions. And while uh, EFI team is uh, basically processing the questions, uh, we can have a look, uh, or we can take a look at one short, it's only one, two minutes long, the video on resin. And it's basically a worker in the wood talking about the resin extraction techniques. Gerard, can you start uh, video number two, please? Thank you. Hola, me llamo Iván. Para quien no conozca mucho el trabajo de resinero, que es un trabajo de temporada, consiste básicamente en extraer la resina del pino, mediante unos cortes o incisiones que se llaman picas, a los cuales se les aplica un estimulante para que el pino expulse la resina. 
eh, se obtienen diferentes subproductos que están, están muy presentes en la vida cotidiana en, para multitud de usos, desde lacas, barnices, disolventes, aditivos para motores, eh, para tablas de surf, eh, soldaduras para estaño como aislante, la resina como recurso natural es un, es un combustible no fósil, hipocarbónico, cuyos principales competidores provienen de los hidrocarburos, como el petróleo, que sí que son más contaminantes. Los aprovechamientos resineros son compatibles con otro tipo de aprovechamiento, como el maderero, eh, micológico, eh, cinegético... La, la extracción de resina creo que revitaliza las zonas rurales y puede ayudar fijando población. El resinero, al fin y al cabo, lo que hace es eh, custodiar el monte y cuidar de los pinos, de los árboles. Como mejoras que se pueden introducir en el sector, pues creo que desde el, el, desde el sector privado, que es el, jefe, el que fija el precio, un precio que sea justo, esto es, que sea rentable y estable. Por parte de la administración pública, pues lo que también se lleva demandando durante muchísimos años es la, la puesta en marcha del contrato territorial, que es una herramienta por la cual se reconocen todas estas, estas, estas realizaciones positivas que genera el oficio de resinero, este para el medio ambiente y para la economía, y por lo tanto para la sociedad. También se necesita que se siga invirtiendo en, en investigación y desarrollo, eh, sobre todo en zonas que son menos productivas por diferentes factores, que tenga al, al resinero como, como figura principal, o sea, que no lo expulse del pinar, que sea, que sea inclusiva. Eh, un saludo. Excellent. So, what you start to feel here is the human dimension related to this uh, normal forest product sector. And we have this short video, also only one or two minutes, which we will every now and then just insert in the program. Right? Uh, well, what I would like to do next is to hand the word to Inacio Martinez. Um, and he will, uh, he has taken a look at the questions that have popped up. So, Inacio, tell us, uh, I hand the floor to you. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Steven, and thank you to all the speakers, and thank you for this fantastic video, which introduces very much a core element of all questions. So, an element that we believe is behind the questions. The, the man in the resin, resin structure was telling us about the, the price. They need to be a, a price that is stable and uh, enough for the worker. And there are several questions about the economic profitability of this question in relation to Cork, the investments, the period of return, in, in, in terms of how much you pay the worker, in terms of also uh, how much resin you can extract. And so there's a general topic of, of um, profitability. And this comes to the to, to common theme of the bioeconomy and, and also non good for products, which is the capacity to deliver value in the land for the worker or for the owner. Even in sophisticated value chains like the one we saw in Cork, they are seeing difficulties that are jeopardizing cork extraction in many traditional areas where, where salaries are high and it's difficult to attract people to the activity. So the question, the question will be uh, how, how, what, what needs to be done or, or, or how to move forward uh, in terms of creating more value to the land, uh, which is a difficult question, I guess. And this links also to a question for Patricia that was saying, should we change reform in terms of access to the land in natural areas? So are we jeopardizing the risk of, of, of this uh, non good forest value chains to create value for at the bottom of the, of the value chain? What will be things to be done? I think there's a question for, for Joao, for Mariana, uh, uh, and, for, and, for, and for all. So who wants to take the floor first? Perhaps Patricia, Mrs. Shandy? Also for Hamed, huh? because the access to the resource is also an issue in Tunisia in aromatics, yeah. I believe. <clears throat> Inacio? Yes? Uh, I, I was typing an answer. I, I, I'm not sure whether I could uh, listen to, to your question. Uh, no. and understand the, 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 the global approach, but you, you, you spoke about attracting people. Yes, I was thinking that there, there is a limited profitability at the bottom of the value chain and li limited capacity, let's say, to pay affordable salaries or for the workers or for the collectors to make a, a, a profit. And, and this has limitations in terms of the market, the competition, the concurrence. So the idea, so the, you see all these value chains in the bio economy in general happens with wood also. It's a certain incapacity to, to develop value. And so the, the recent speaker was telling us about this territorial contract to put in positive externalities, for example, payment of ecosystem service. What else do we need to be able to create value also 
at the very bottom value chain, which is at least jeopardizing the, for example, resin extraction in Europe or cork extraction in France. So it's difficult to keep value at the bottom of the value chain. What, 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 will, what, what forward will you see in this? Well, we, we, um, I, I answered already a, a couple of these questions uh, in the in the Q and A and in the chat. But honestly, and uh, we have a, an average uh, wage in a in a daily base for the workers that are doing the harvesting in the cork sector. That it's around 100 to 120 euros per day, which is clearly we say one of the best uh, world agricultural jobs and paid jobs in the world. Of course, it's not it's not everything because it's a, it's a tough job, it's a difficult job, it's a very skilled job, and so we are working hard also to find technology that can support to 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 help these workers and to to be more effective, to increase productivity without and this is our focus anytime damaging the the true value of the relation between man and nature and without compromising any any of the ecological credentials that these forests have. But, but of course, one of our main, main concerns, it's always as an industrial sector, create the um, applications uses for cork that are really high added value, because we know that the, the, we are very care about the, the, the transfer of value among the supply chain. We are conscious about the, the constraints that the, the, the markets have in, in prices, in, 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 in elasticity of prices in the consumers, even if they have a preference for natural, recyclable, sustainable products, sometimes there are price um, platforms that we cannot overexceed. But we, I, I can tell you that more than ever in our history, for sure, we are working together in the street production um, and hopefully also the, 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 the policymakers to, to find uh, solutions, to find mechanisms, and you spoke about this, uh, the, the payment for the ecosystem services, for the public goods, for many of the things that don't, don't have economic value, but that can they be really, really, really a very important support to, to, to help and to mitigate these, uh, these constraints and jeopardize the difficulties we see in the long term in, in these economical models. But we, many of us talking to politicians we have the, the obligation the responsibility also to transmit this message that we need to see in the long term we cannot always look in the short term we cannot always see the, the day after tomorrow we have to see the benefits for populations the benefits for local to territory to cohesion and we need really to keep passing this message and to find mechanisms to to don't be always always in the short term thank you Shall, shall we perhaps take a look at the question that has come in, a question for Mrs. Shandy, and the question reads, should we review the regulations concerning protected zones in very poor countries to preserve biodiversity, but also enable communities to value traditions, food, medicinal plants, etc., and through local value chains, increase their autonomy, income generation, etc. So that's a long question. Uh, so what is your opinion on this, Mrs. Shanley? Sure. Well, it's a good question, Lilia. And I think we've learned over the last few decades that protected areas and just keeping people out doesn't always work from many perspectives and that um, indigenous and local communities are often best placed to manage areas. And there's a powerful example of that in the Brazilian Amazon with extractive reserves. And it's a model, even though it's problematic in some places, some aspects of it can be used elsewhere. This is where local people do manage. They have value chains. They've developed um, all different types of products from the forest. And there are subsidies from the government, uh, going back to the former question, to support people to stay on the land so that they're not impoverished in cities where they don't have um, skills. And this traditional knowledge is the basis to figure out different levels of use which is remarkable. And some you can log, in some places it's just non-wood forest products and it, they're sophisticated management systems. So notably, these areas, if you look at maps of deforestation today and Mapa Biomas in Brazil is doing remarkable maps, you can see that these indigenous protected areas um, are really a buffer to deforestation while they're also supporting local livelihoods. And yes, they're under threat right now with the current administration, but that that does not take away the power of that model for other places. 
Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I am looking at the time, and it's basically 1.30, and we stated that we would have this first session until this time. I'm looking at the Q&A, and I see that the questions basically have been addressed, which is great. Uh, I would still like to, to uh, communicate that if there are more questions coming in, uh, the speakers, those that have uh, appeared as speakers in this Even. first session, still can act or uh, respond to questions uh, using the, the Q&A uh, answering facility. Um, I see that Mr. Ferrer still wants to yes. have a say. Very no, quickly, Stephen. because we are at the very end, so you Just have a to brief comment. Uh, uh, during Patricia's presentation, we have seen a, a song in the, in the video, the last song. And of course, I was lucky that I could understand because it was in Brazilian. But if you can find that video subtitled, uh, in English or in any other language, it's a really beautiful lyric, and it's it's amazing how they transform that in a simple way in a in a simple song. It's really beautiful. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. I, I think this is an excellent. This is a high note to end this first session. I would like to thank all speakers, all presenters, even the people that have prepared the video, and that uh, rather than being with us in persona for language barriers or for other reasons. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for participating, for bringing in your contributions. Thank you for the questions, uh, dear participants. And uh, I hope to see you back this afternoon at 3 p.m. for the next session. So have a nice lunch. See you then. Bye-bye.